Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls into heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. All right, we will continue with that uh, with our second Sorrowful Mystery. I'm going to introduce Bear to you. Um, Bear's a, a great man. I've had the privilege to be on his radio program, uh, Big Adventure Radio, uh, EWTN, I forget what it's called, Adventure Radio, but phenomenal human being, phenomenal guy, uh, champion surfer, world champ, tandem surfer, um, lover of Jesus, again, radio evangelist, uh, author, great books. Uh, you're going to feel aloha when he speaks to you, you know. Not only does he, he, he live that aloha, but uh, he loves Jesus and he brings Jesus to aloha, whatever that means. But uh, I would say that Bear um, is uh, this kind of guy that... Uh, uh, he's kind of like a man everyone wants to kind of be like and do the things he, he does. But, you know, he's got great humility, and uh, he's done great things for the Lord. And I've had blessed to know him over the years and to, to, uh, to just talk with him and learn from him. Um, he's going to talk about the 12 rules of manliness, I think, today. I think it's part of his talk. So let's welcome uh, Indiana Welcome to Hawaiian Cocoa Beach native Bear Wozniak. <laughs> Aloha. He doesn't know what aloha means. It means to give breath. And in Hawaii, the men uh, touch foreheads and they breathe. And the women touch your cheek and they breathe. And so you share breath. And that's what Jesus did, right? He said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. And he breathed the Holy Spirit. And didn't God the Father do that, or God did that uh, with Adam and Eve, right? He made man out of mud, and then he uh, breathed his life-giving spirit into them. So uh, good to see all the, the men of the mud here at St. Leon East Central. I want to get my directions right. I love this school. It's a beautiful school. I heard they had to build it. They had to do a building addition to fit all the trophies have, that they've won. So we're in interesting times. Uh, it's the times of, uh, it reminds me somewhat like the French Revolution. It also reminds me of the Cristeros. How, where are our Latinos? Are there any Latinos in the house today? Anybody here know who the Cristeros are? The great Cristeros? when uh, the socialists took over in Mexico not very long ago, or a little over 100 years ago, and they, uh, they, uh, they shut down the Catholic churches, just like they did during the French Revolution. And uh, we're kind of like in that, it seems to me we're kind of in that time in some sense right now. Uh, and you see that with what's happening, with what happened with Mark. And aren't we glad, Mark, for Mark? And we want, we want, uh, I'm going to try to readjust this, there. We want to join Mark on the front lines in what God's doing today. Uh, and so uh, that's who you guys are, that's why you're here, that's why God has called you as men here. So I've got a new book out, it's called um, 12, 12 Rules of Manliness, it's based on Mark Hauk basically, I just took his life and... And it's called, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? So normally I, I speak more extemporaneously. Extemporaneously. That's, I don't know, seven syllables. or so. But I'm not that smart. It's too many syllables. So if you don't mind today, I'm going to do a little bit more of, of looking at my notes than I normally would do. But remember the Cristeros, uh, the courage uh, of the Cristeros, how they stood for their faith. And so I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to ask all the young men, like say 20 nine years and younger to stand up. Can you guys stand up? Yeah. Praise God. We love you men. We're so proud of you. So proud of you. You guys are gonna, you guys, we keep standing, keep standing. We've made our stand as men, but I think God's gonna require more of you.
And so I'd like the other men to stand up and just put their hands on their shoulders and we'll say a quick prayer for these young men. God has a, a unique call for each one of you. And we need for you to stand with us. We're welcoming you to the front lines. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, fill these young men with a blazing fire, uh, a, a furnace of love for you, and a willingness to lay down their life for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat, men. I'm going to get you guys to do calisthenics. This is a Catholic gathering, right? So, uh, does anybody know the cry of the Cristeros? Okay. So maybe we'll stand one more time. I'm not going to make you kneel. We'll stand one more time. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Amen. Does anybody know the last part of that? Okay, viva. Christ the King. But the, the, yes, long live Christ the King. But then there's okay, viva. And then there's uh, I don't know how the rest goes, but then there's a, a prayer to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Okay, now you guys can uh, genuflect. Okay, up again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you got to be patient with me. I'm really excited about this this event and this conference. So I'm going to make sure I go through my notes here. Hopefully it won't bore you too much. The subtitle of the book is Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Matt Dillon picked me up yesterday at the airport. Do you guys know Matt, Matt Keck? He was uh, named after Matt Dillon. And as a young man, I was raised on the, the, the westerns, you know, Gunsmoke, Bonanza, Roy Rogers, the Lone Ranger, Rawhide, and uh, and I was and I became as a young man. I was a banker. I traveled the country as a commercial banker, and I, I'd always pick up my Louis L'Amour westerns, which I just think every young man needs to read those westerns. Who here likes Louis L'Amour? Is anybody? Yeah, I would read that to your sons because his, his westerns were all about men of virtue, uh, men who live by a certain code. I was I was riding with my my wife Cindy. You know, today if you've done the Liturgy of the Hour, it talks, it's Proverbs 31, and it talks about the, the, what, a, what a, a perfect wife is, what a perfect woman is, and I'm, and I just, just so thankful for my wife. She, she stands with me in all, everything that we do. Uh, but we were driving along Diamond Head, and she said, you gotta listen to this song, you're gonna love it, and she turns it up, and I don't remember the woman's name who was singing it, but this, the words are, where is my John Wayne? Where is my prairie song? Where is my happy ending? Where have all the cowboys gone? And that's the subtitle of the book, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Uh, when my wife and I go into events where there's men and women, we can't even get out of the car before we're, uh, we're surrounded by women of all ages saying, you got to tell our men we need for them to be men again. You know, women are, women are, uh, men are made out of mud, the woman comes from his rib. They're more highly uh, d distilled, I've heard someone say. They're, they're, you know, they're this beautiful but powerful people. Uh, but they need their men to get, be willing to, to have the grit and the rawness and the realness to lead the family. So I'm going to have to keep my glasses on or I'll skip ahead of things. So we need men. So the, the cowboy. John Wayne said, you are born a boy, but you got to become a man. It's something you grow into. And I wanted to be tough like these cowboys. Have you guys heard the saying, uh, tough times make for tough men? Hard I think it goes, hard times make for hard men. Hard men make for soft times, right? The men are tough and they establish and they make a world that's easier for those that they love. Hard times make for hard men. Hard men make for soft times. Soft times make for soft men. And soft men make for hard times. I think we're, we've gone through that time where tough men made things good, easier for us. And we got soft. And so, I don't know where you think we are on this, but I think in this scale of one to four, we're at that place where soft men are making for tough times. 
if you look around us in the United States, that's what I see. But I think looking at the men in this conference, the soft men have made for soft times, but these men, these men are tough men, and we're going to tough times create tough men, and it's time for us to be tough. It's time for us to go to the front of the front of the line and be ready for battle. And that starts on your knees, right? It starts in spiritual warfare. They, the, the generation grows up feeling that they're owed a comfortable life. They're coddled and nurtured by their parents, their school, and the government, protected from consequences for not, not realizing until it's too late that to the degree that you are taken care of is the degree to which you lose your freedom. And in time, that safe place that we all hear about that's provided for them is really just a personal prison for them. The modern soft man takes offense at whatever the new fad is to take offense at and they don't live by the creed of St. Paul that asserts love doesn't take offense. Their biggest risk is trying something new at Starbucks. I admit my wife's got me hooked on that one o'clock ice cold Starbucks. Their epitaph will read died at age 18 buried at age 80. At best, they're only nice guys. Doesn't that make you throw up? But they're far from being good men. It is only when a boy faces adversity and accepts kuleana, as we say in Hawaii, responsibility for himself and others, that a, grow, a, a boy grows to be a man. I love John Wayne. My wife and I, during COVID, we watched all of those great westerns, a lot of them written by Louis L'Amour. John Wayne said in the movie McClintock, to be a gentleman, you first have to be a man. And you see these boys standing up and taking offense at everything, thinking that they're, uh, you know, I guess they call them virtue signalers. But they're not gentlemen, they're not even men. These historical Christian values, these traditions, some say, are just meant for the ash heap. But every cowboy knows upon returning to camp after their night watch on a trail drive, that found within the ashes of a fire pit can be the hot embers that he can fan into flame so he can have a scalding hot cup of coffee. Whenever you read Louis L'Amour, he's always drinking coffee. He talks about hot coffee all the time. When you read Hemingway, it's usually about a mojito or rum, but I would say that Louis L'Amour was a real man. We need to fan into flame the hidden embers and the ashes of traditional Catholic values that desire and put a fire in our belly that makes us strong and perhaps even a bit dangerous. Be the kind of man that when you roll out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. <laughs> you, guys, you guys know men like that. You're probably one of those men. It's time for us to be men, to be the hero. You know, every man has in him that desire to be a hero, and it's not an egotistical thing. It's, it's the way you're wired. It's, it's by your very nature that you want to step into the gap. Got to have some water. Between danger and the vulnerable. All my cowboys were heroes. Here's a quote from Louis L'Amour. The cowboys, they were men who put others first, who rode for the brand, who persevered, who fought while wounded, and we're all wounded, that's not a reason not to fight. You'll get stronger on the battlefield. They were dangerous, not to be trifled with. Are we dangerous anymore? I know, I, the men that I bumped into in this last, last little while, I wouldn't want to mess with. I could tell that they're men of purpose, and they're men that stand for something, and you, you, you know, not like they're gonna provoke a fight, but you wouldn't want to push them. We need to be dangerous. There actually needs to be a sense of danger when a man enters a room, you, know to, you need to know that man may be humble, but he's not someone to be trifle, trifled with. There's a difference between meekness and weakness. Men need to be strong. And I don't mean just in their hearts, but men need to be physically fit enough to first of all withstand the test of their own life so they can live long enough and have the energy to fulfill their mission, but also when it comes down to it, when your family's in danger, are you willing to step up? Mark's a great example of that. He used just enough force to protect his son. 
So I always challenge men. You know, when men, we have something called the man cave. My website's deepadventure.com. And when men join our man cave and are in, enter into the three-year school of manliness, we all go through it together and fathers go through it with their sons. The, one of the first things they do is they go, oh, oh, that's what this is. I need to get fit, physically fit. Do I do my cardio? Do my, do my resistance training? Am I eating, am I eating right? Men need to be, we need to be warriors, not just in our spiritual walk, but in every way. We need to be physically fit and ready to take on the everyday challenges. And if, and if it comes down to it, at least know how to throw a punch and know how to kick. Cowboys were men that put others first, who rode for the brand, who got the job done come hell or high water. They persevered, they kept fighting when they were wounded. They were as dangerous as a rattlesnake or a cornered mountain lion. They were not to be taken lightly. You know, my friend, anyone here know Jason Jones? He's a, he's a great pro-life activist, a good friend of mine from Hawaii, who now lives in Texas, by the way. But we were, we were interviewing him and Doug Berry on the, on the cliffs of Diamond Head. Uh, I mean, I was just editing this for our next season of Long Ride Home. And uh, he was talking about how he went up to his priest because he went up to receive the Eucharist and the man handing out the Eucharist had a Masonic ring on. And he went up to the priest and said, this man shouldn't even be receiving communion, much less being a Eucharistic minister. And the priest rebuked him. He said, you know what? You're making people, people feel uncomfortable. And Jason said... Well, when a lion enters the room, maybe you should feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I don't know what St. Leon means, but Leo, I guess who was, was named after actually St. Leo, this, this town and the school, lion, he was a lion. We need men to be lions. We need to be dangerous. I don't mean we need to provoke a fight, but we need to have a reason for our faith, and we need to be prayed up every morning, spend that hour uh, with the Lord in prayer. If you're not spending an hour every day with the Lord, either in reading scriptures, meditating on his word, studying to show yourself approved, and in prayer, you're a poser. In, in, in Hawaii, uh, like my surf, my, our, our surf can get big. This last summer, we had 30-foot 30, 30 swells hitting the south shores of Waikiki. And my son, Jeremiah, he's towed in surf, where you get towed in behind a, a jet ski uh, because it waved is moving so fast when it's really big that you can't catch it by paddling 85 foot surf so when you when you when you uh when when it the surf comes up in hawaii we see people on the beach tourists off and they're wearing something from abercrombie and fitch and it says lifeguard we know they're posers and then when the surf comes up when the surf comes up you know the posers don't paddle out but we're in big surf. We, need, we can't afford to be posers anymore. If you're not spending an hour every day with the Lord, you're a poser. You need to spend time in prayer in the morning, praying the rosary while you're driving and uh, maybe receiving going to Mass. I love the practice of the liturgy of the hour. I get up early. I have my prayer time. A couple hours later, my wife gets up. We go have our morning coffee, and we finish the liturgy of the hour together. We need our men to be men of prayer because without prayer, you know, women will ask me, what am I going to do with my husband? He, he just won't come to church. What should I do? And people say, well, I guess the only thing you can do is pray. That's BS. The only thing you can do is pray? Like, that's your last resort? That has to be the first thing we do. We need to be men of prayer. In Hawaii, people say, how long, how, what does it take to surf big waves? I give them my 20, 20, 20 rule. I'm not a big wave surfer. I've surfed big waves, but I'm not like some of my friends who when they see the low pressure system a thousand miles over Hawaii, they go, good, it's going to get 40 foot plus. Those things scare me, you know. I just have the wrong kind of friends. Sometimes I've, I've paddled out with them, but... But if you're going to surf big waves, like the summer before my, my son surfed those big, that big surf, we went out every oh, two or three times a week. We'd paddle out about a quarter of a mile, dive down. I would hold his board, and he'd grab a boulder and run underwater because it keeps your weight down. And then I would take my turn to do it, and we would get our cardio while holding our breath. And at sunset, uh, we would... Uh, we have a tradition of holding our breath for the two minutes and 20 seconds it takes for the sun to hit the horizon and set. And you should be able to paddle your board 20 miles. You know, I paddled my surfboard across from the island of Molokai, where my, my dad and mom lived for a while, and my dad was a deacon there. Uh, 25, 30 miles, actually it's about 28 miles, and then, but to get to where I needed to go was 35 miles. 
You need to be able to paddle at least 20 miles without stopping or you're a poser. You're not going to survive in big surf. So I call that my 20-20-20 rule. If you're a man, and you are, you wouldn't even be here, you need to spend that time with the Lord. Sometimes it's 20 minutes of prayer, 20 minutes of the liturgy, going to the mass, but you need to group, maybe break it up into three sets of 20. But you're in big surf, and if you're not praying, praying isn't the last resort. It's the first thing, is to spend time with God. Cowboys, more than anything, are any, anything else, are the real thing. What you see is what you get. You, they're, they're not peop, men of God. You, 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 they're not hiding in the shadows or acting like something they're not. They're not two different people. There's a lot of martyrs today uh, in, in the workplace. They, they get to keep their job, but they're not going to get promoted because they won't be part of the, uh, the Rainbow Committee for that year's gay pride events. You know, that people know, oh, yeah, we can't fire them, but don't promote them. I know many men that have found themselves in that position. Are there any bikers here? I guess there's no bikers in Indiana. You guys want to stand up for a minute? Where are my bikers? I know there's a few. Come on, where are they? All right, I love you guys. Love you guys. Thanks. You can, you guys need to get in front of the line at confession. <laughs> well, bikers uh, have a lot in common with cowboys. Uh, they're, first of all, a real brotherhood. Uh, but we have a lot of time for solitude, you know, in the saddle. And a lot of my, I know every one of you here probably prays the rosary while you ride. Uh, and that's what a cowboy does. He spends that time in solitude. He spends that time in prayer. And he also, when you, you know, when you pray in the rosary, you have, it becomes almost um, like praying in tongues. It's, you're just, you're just praying and you're kind of soaring and then God speaks to you. You know, you're, you're praying the rosary, but you're not really thinking about the words so much and God whispers, he gives you nudges and they can be dangerous, very dangerous nudges. So being, praying those types of prayers, you get to hear God's voice. And when, when you get to hear God's voice and he tells you to do stuff, that's where you get to see God move. You don't get to see God move if you're not in his will. And so our bikers spend a lot of time in intercessory prayer on those bikes and also just in solitude. Cowboys were perceptive. Part of their ease in making decisions was because they knew what they stood for and they also knew how to make a stand. They knew what they believed and they lived by a personal creed and they lived by what is called the cowboy code. It's not written down, but every cowboy knows it. They were quick to act when needed. They weren't clever or conniving. That's what the virtue of prudence is. It's not clever. It's just uh, a clarity of knowing what God's will is and purpose is and knowing your best way to approach it. You know, people get, get mistaken about the virtue of prudence. They think it's for people who sit on the couch and they're too prudent to do anything dangerous. The rea reality is you don't need to be prudent unless you're going to do something daring. And if you're a Christian, God's calling you to do something very bold every day of your life. Um, and so like when you go, like I, I've watched them launch the, the spaceships in Port Canaveral. I, I, when we were filming, I had a place there for a few years. And you get to listen to their countdown and they go like downrange, check, uh, fuel injection, check, whatever. They just go down all these checklists. When I was a private pilot, I will go down a checklist before I go fly. Well, flying is kind of bold, especially if you're me, because I'm not that good at it. But... <laughs> But I went, I was being prudent. And so prudence isn't an excuse for, for not being bold. Every big wave rider is very prudent. And being bold is what gives you that chance to step out. Every one of you, God has a, a specific purpose and plan for your life. And it requires you to listen, experience that little nudge, and then move out in the Holy Spirit. And to be prudent, but to be bold. Right now, some of you know what I'm talking about. You already know that God's put something on your heart that you've ignored. Or there's something that's being required of you. And you need to be prudent and you need to be bold and step out. Looking at the clock here, trying to zip through here. Cowboys could be trusted. 
They gave each to each man what they had due from him. That's the, the virtue of justice. Their guns were loaded and ready. There's a saying, there is a saying that uh, John Wayne says in one of his westerns, it's a Louis L'Amour western, a, life, a, a rifle in the wagon is worthless. If you're a Christian, if you're a Catholic, you need to have your guns loaded and when you empty them, you need to, re, you need to clean them and, and reload. And to me, that again, that means times of study. What I love to do is when we have cigar nights, which we didn't get to do here because it, I guess, too cold here, but I love to ask the men, what books are you reading right now? You know, some, some men really love to listen to books because they're not, most men don't like to read. But reading or studying or what, are you, who, what book are you listening to, you need to be developing a, a deep understanding of your faith. You need to keep your, 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 as I say, the ammo dry and keep your guns loaded. You need to be prayed up. What if all of a sudden, you know, um, you're, you're out surfing and then the surf comes up so fast sometimes and you're not ready? You need to be, you need to, uh, you need to have, always have it the ready. I loved when I rode up in Louisiana, Louisiana, as I say there, and the, and the Catholic Crossbearers Motorcycle Club, which was uh, founded in Cleveland, Eric Wardroom, Love that man. He was converted while he was in prison. We rode up on these four bikers. They met us in Louisiana. And I thought, how nice of them. But I realized they were just meeting us so they could make sure we got out of Louisiana and, you know, <laughs> and rode into Texas. They wanted to get rid of us as soon as they could, I guess. But when I rode up on them, I asked them, uh, it looked like a Mexican standoff, as they call it. And I said, we all rode up and they're all standing there. And I go, show us your weapons. And uh, they all brought out rosaries out of their vests. I have my rosary here. My, my Benedictine rosary, exorcism rosary. This is the, the Eastern prayer of the early church fathers because I'm a Benedictine oblate. Jesus, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Each of these little rope prayers, which was, actually predates the rosary. So we need to have our, our guns ready. Satan glorifies the metrosexual, pornography-driven, woke, genderless, sissified, self-seeking, glory-seeking, money-seeking, atheistic, afraid of his own shadow, won't get off the couch or out of his parents' basement, won't ask a girl out, may take her to bed but not marry her, has dogs instead of kids, has lots of toys, kind of a boy man, whose greatest virtue is taking offense at whatever the latest cancel culture fad dictates. That's the, that's the image of men today. Society has enlisted the devil's diabolical sissifying of men, marginalization of fathers, and culture canceling of families. BS. I would like to say it stronger, but when someone says it takes a village to raise a child, it's BS. It takes a family. It takes a father and a mother. I love what Archbishop, Archbishop Chaput said. I was, got, to be, got to listen to him once uh, in Napa, and someone asked the question, so Archbishop, what is the, what's the really good evangelization you know, sort of program that we can all take back to our parishes? And he said, get married, have lots of children, raise them up in the faith. That's the domestic church, and that's God's evangelization uh, plan. And I know there's so many families, that, men that I've met just so far that I know that's their commitment, the domestic church. I'm going to go off script a little bit because I have ADHD, which I love, by the way, having it. People around me don't like it, but I love it. <laughs> you know the story of Nehemiah when he went back to rebuild? There's this thing, the, the, I think Matt is involved in Others in, you know, in the Knights of Columbus with the stepping into the breach. Well, in the book of Nehemiah, it's kind of boring, really, part, big part of it is. Nehemiah went back and he could see that the temple walls had been, were, were falling apart. And he challenged the people there to rebuild. And the first part of the, the big part of Nehemiah is just listing so-and-so with a name I can't pronounce. And his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And this man and his family rebuilt it from here to here. And this man is, and it goes clockwise around the temple. It's the men and their families. It's the domestic church that needs to rebuild the wall. If you don't think there's a breach in the wall, if you don't know where it is, it's probably in your living room. We need to be fathers to our children. 
That's why we love our school of manliness, because the school of manliness, we go through it together, wherever, if we're at, if we're at year, year two, month two, like we are now, all the men are in that place. And in our man cave, we have our, our monthly Zoom meetups, but then the fathers take their sons through that same curriculum, and I just, I just think it's great, because young men, I don't know about the young men here, but when, I, when I'd ask my son, so how was your day? Okay, what did you do? Nothing. What did you learn? Same old thing. But the School of Manliness allows you guys to have a deeper conversation with your sons. Our world has been pushed past the point of teetering on the edge of destruction. We're careening down the slippery slope. The neutered social justice warrior sees himself as a victim. He demands society takes care of him and spends more time looking in the mirror than looking into the empty chasm of his own soul. His quest in life seems to be more about winning the latest video game than seeking worthy goals and challenges that require him to grow in virtue. His first thoughts are for his own comfort rather than a willingness to lay down his life to serve God and others. He thinks of what he can get instead of what he can give. Holy Spirit, we just pray for you to move in the hearts of these men. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. Let, you, let your word be here today, Lord. Let the word go in like a, like a fast-growing seed into the hearts of men and let new things spring forth today in the, in the hearts of these men. He falls in an ever and inward downward spiral as he fills himself with more and more emptiness while victimizing women through his porn addiction. But does not and does not save his virginity or pray for that special woman who perhaps has never he's not even met yet. Before I met my my wife, and I have to say I've gone through the 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 heartbreak of a divorce and an annulment, and praise God now for my marriage. But I was I was a virgin on my on my wedding night. That that's considered insane now. But you young men, save it for your wife and pray for her, even though you haven't met her yet. Fast for her. Today's man boy puts career or playing first. And, he and I used to joke about this, but it's kind of true. He, measured his, he measures his happiness by the number of pistons he owns. I think that's legitimate. <laughs> what are how many pistons? Who, who, who owns the most pistons? <laughs> not saying that that's not okay to have a lot of pistons. But uh, that's not where your goal, that's not where your heart is. And so... A man, there's, there's a thing John Wayne said, another one of Louis L'Amour's westerns called Hondo. A man's got to have a code, a creed he can live by, no matter what. A man's got to have a, co a creed and a code he can live by. And so this book that I wrote, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Um, it goes through 12 rules, which are, there's many more. But to me, that's the code. That's the code that a man lives by. I'm a Benedictine oblate. You know about the rules of St. Benedict. So the creed is like, this is the essence of my purpose in my life. And the code is how you, how you uh, do that. And so I think every man, if I could leave with one message, well, I'm here. I'm not, by, by the way, I'm not done yet. Don't get your hopes up. But <laughs> take time to write down what your creed is. What is it you stand for? What is, what is it you stand for? A creed is a standard you live by. And back in the day, well, I think it's still true. Well, back in the day when they would, when they would charge uh, uh, with, when the knights would charge in or the cavalry, they carried what? A standard, a flag. So they knew what, the troops knew where the, what they needed to rally to. And the generals could see how they were deployed based on the standards that were out there and they could, they could do their strategies. Well, what standard do you run to? What is it that you stand for? You should know that. You need to take time to write down a creed. I was talking to one of the men back here. I, I'm so bad with names. And he carries a journal wherever he goes. So maybe, he'll, maybe he has a creed or he'll have one by the end of the day. Every man should take a long look at what he stands for, what his life is all about, and what rules he will live by. Every man needs to define his own personal creed and then a code of rules to help him fulfill that mission. God has a great story for you. I've been going through my phone, deleting old pictures because I've run out of room because, you know, we do a lot of video on our cameras for our TV show. Deleting stuff going back to 2000 and 
six or something. And it's so interesting because I can see my life and I can see the wrong directions I went or I, I thought I was, you know, but then, but I see God progress, always moving me along a path of adventure, you know, for, for my life. And I do remember the one day when uh, suddenly my wife Cindy's picture shows up for the first time. I go, oh, I didn't know all that heartache and all that, all that went before that God had this adventure that I would share with this, with my wife Cindy. So God has a, an adventure for us. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, I was talking to someone the other day and they think, well, in heaven, we're just going to sit and worship God. No, I think the adventure is going to get even more exciting. We'll get to be, in, we'll always be beholding God's face, but he's going to have an adventure. He's going to have work for you to do there too. Because Jesus said, my father and I, we work. Some say you can really get to know a man and how he responds to adversity. But I would, my, my thought is, we don't, I mean, we do have our adversities, but relatively, we have a pretty soft life, you know? We get to have uh, cold beer instead of warm beer, you know? And uh, there's usually food on the table, and not always the case, but usually we have soft toilet paper. We live a pretty soft life. And I think one of the things that biggest challenges for men is how do you remain a strong, tough man during soft times? You know, one of the greatest challenges Abraham Lincoln said was they, they talked about this one man they wanted to promote, that he was really gritty during tough times. He goes, well, show me how he is when he's prosperous. That'll tell me what his true, his true virtue is. How he responds to adversity, yes. But how do we do re respond? Do we squander our leisure time? I mean, we need to have times of recreation or recreation. We need to have times of leisure. But do we squander the finances that we have? Are we investing them into the kingdom? Are we, uh, are we spending time with our children? How are we, how are we, uh, I mean, I'm, I love watching football. I love it. But you should only, I only watch one football game a weekend. <laughs> So we have to learn how to use that time. You remember the monks of the desert, what their saying was, memento mori? Who knows that, that saying? You raise your hand, and everyone that doesn't know should genuflect. <laughs> well, it, it has the history from back in Roman times when a general would, would win a great victory. He would come into Rome with all of his prize, all the, the jewels and all the wealth, and the slaves that he took, and everyone would cheer for him. It was called a triumph. But there would be a, a man, a slave, walking just behind his horse, uh, saying the words memento mori over and over and over during the whole time. And it just means remember your death. And we, we as men, we need to learn to live like we're going to die. The monks of the desert around the year three, in the fourth century, as they went out into the desert to, to pray, that was what they would, they would live isolated lives. But when they got together, they still wouldn't really speak to each other, except for they would say the words memento mori. We have to live like we're going to die. You know, the, the, if, if you love the, the movie, the, Flight, the Fight Club, you're not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. Memento mori. Remember. You need to live like you're going to die. What are you going to pass down to your children? What are they going to remember you for? A man's got to have a creed. My, my creed is the most radical quest you can have in life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. If you want to have a wild ride, abandon yourself to God's will. And God's will, you know, because God is love, God's will is, is, is love. But if you want to have a wild ride in what man doesn't, I remember the first time I dropped into Waimea. Anybody know what Waimea Bay is? It was, it was where the Eddie I Cow event was uh, a few weeks ago. It's only held when it's 45 foot or bigger. So last time it was held was 2016. When you drop in, you can't surf Waimea unless it's big. It, it, it doesn't break until it's really big. When the other, when the other way, uh, surf spots on the North Shore are closed out because it's so big. That's when YMA begins to break. And um, I remember the first time I paddled out there, I was so scared. I always scared when you paddle out at YMA. And um, I was kind of measuring the sets. They call them Hey Hey Nalu, mountain waves. And I was watching, you paddle out, 
and the current takes you out, the riptide takes you out like a chairlift, about a quarter of a mile or a third of a mile, and you're at that outer reef, and you're timing the sets and uh, watching to see where they're breaking. And then you paddle in. I remember I paddled over to the takeoff zone, and I'm like, God, I wish I didn't have these kind of friends, you know, that dragged me out here. But my friend David Pu'u, who's just a wonderful man, he was out there. He's a, one of the greatest surf photographers in the world. He was out there on, with his fins, swimming with his water housing, and he finally swam up to me in front of all these guys and go, my sister in army boots could surf better than you. So. <laughs> Anybody see what Tiger Woods did yesterday, the other day? It was kind of a Tiger Woods moment. So I had to respond to that, and I finally dropped in. But when you drop into a big wave, you're not surfing the wave. It owns you. When my son Jeremiah dropped into that 85-foot wave, he rode it for over a mile and a quarter. Um, he, 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 all he was doing was, you know, trying to go with the flow of that wave. In the very end, Think about it, it's, it was taller than this building, much taller than this building. And you, we have it on video, but the, it, the guys that filmed it were so far away, right, that he's smaller than a pixel when he first drops in. But he was riding just to survive. In the very end, when it barreled over, you could fit semi-trucks into that barrel. His only choice was to do a quick, not even a bottom turn, but halfway down the wave to turn hard, and he supermaned up through the thickness of a 10-foot lip and somehow made it out the other side. But when he towed in, before he towed in, his whole life, by the way, he wanted to do this. Um, my friend Crazy Todd, who I love so much, atheist, very evangelistic atheist, by the way, uh, pray for him, Crazy Todd Robertson. Um, Jeremiah towed into a couple 45-foot waves, which is huge. I think it's at least t this tall. And then he go, you like go big. And Jeremiah had to really think about it for a while. It wasn't like some aggro, yeah, let's do it, man. It was, he had to decide that he was willing to die. Memento more. His whole life he'd been preparing for that moment. And after about a minute he said, yeah. And what he did was he, he made the decision then that he would die. And okay, now that that's set, now I can go do what I'm gonna do. Uh, in, in big wave surfing, tow in is where you get towed in by a jet ski and, and you let go of the rope. And then the guy on the jet ski is up here on the wave, kind of on the other side of the crest, and you're down here and he just tries to follow that crest and every now and then tries to look over to see where you are. But once you're in that wave, you're alone. You're, you, no one's going to get to you for a long time. Um, I was talking to Keenan out here the, earlier, my friend Clyde I. Cowett, the Eddie's named after his brother, who died uh, in the maiden voyage of the Hokulea, trying to save uh, people on, on this voyaging canoe. And um, he, when, you, when you drop in, you don't own that wave, it owns you. Total abandonment to the wave. And, uh, and you just hope that um, your, your, your jet ski guy will be there to pick you up at the end. Well, that's what we should live our lives like. Why not totally abandon ourselves to God's adventure for our life? You know what the biggest problem with the younger generation is? They're afraid to ask a girl out on a date, and if they start dating a girl, this is what the women tell me when we show up. They won't ask us out, they'll hang out, but they don't ask us out, they're cowards. They won't, if they do ask us out and we, they, we start dating, they don't ask us to marry them, they're cowards. Uh, and then if they ask us to marry them, we don't get married. And then eventually we have children. Um, there's a scripture verse that I think is profound and it needs to be said to the young, men of, the young men of this time. The words that the angel said to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary to you as your wife. Satan hates marriage. And so for you young men, that's the greatest adventure you can have is, is marriage. Or as a priest, you know, to be a father to the church. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, I, in fact, I will just, I'll just go that direction because I have ADHD. One of the things about a cowboy is, I think the thing that defines a man more than anything is how he treats women. I got in touch with one of my friends, Timothy McCormick. He's in our TV show, Long Ride Home. 
after 40 years of not seeing him or 30 years or something. And he told me we're having, uh, he, loves, he loves his scotch. I love whiskey, but I don't like scotch. I'm not man enough. But we were sitting having a scotch and, and I was having a whiskey as we were about to film the first episodes of Long Ride Home. And he said, the one thing I remember about you, Bear, was that you respected women, the way you spoke about women, how you treated women. And, uh, and so for, for all of us, especially for the younger men, how you treat a woman really defines you. And the biggest challenge men have right now, I think, a pro I, they interview Protestant pastors, how many of your men have a challenge with pornography? And they'll go, oh, maybe 10%. Then they ask Catholic priests and they go, oh, well over half. Because priests go to, con priests hear confession. Man, that's a battle you have to, you have to win. You have to win that battle. When I was young, pornography was like something hidden in the back of a garage behind some, some uh, tools that every now and then a young kid would find or a young teenager would find. But, but now it's, uh, Satan has, is on full-on attack. Don't be his... You know, Satan's a punk. Don't be his whipping boy. Don't, don't submit to pornography. Resist the devil and he will flee. The, you know, the word sin both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, comes from an archery term, which means to miss the mark. You know, where you aim an arrow is where the arrow's going to go, right? Pretty much. So where is your focus? If, your fo if you bring your focus to pornography, that's going to be a slow, inward, downward spiral of shame. But if you give your focus to Jesus, if you go to Mass, if you go to confession, if you, if you spend time in prayer, your focus on Jesus will help you hit the mark. When I tandem surf, I, I tandem surf with a woman once who had been through some pretty dangerous partners. Your tandem surfing is when you lift a woman in very extreme lifts when you surf, and that's where my world titles are in. Um, she, I, I had to get her to turn so she could, you know, leap. And every, play, every time I lift a woman, I ask them, I tell them where they need to put their focus. And she couldn't turn. And I finally realized it's because she's looking straight ahead. She's so scared of the wave. And I finally told her, close your eyes. And when I say turn, turn. And then she could do the lift. Her focus was causing her, uh, was causing her own destruction. Um, and so it's the same thing with us. We need to, um, and when a woman is in a lift, she has a certain place her eyes need to look. It's the horizon. It's my shoulder. It might be this hand. But when she, when she does that, she locks in. And so we as men, we need to keep our focus on Jesus, and that's how you win the mark. And then I want to close with this. Um, one of the virtues, one of the, one of the rules for manliness is brotherhood. I used to have, have a cabin in Montana. Well, actually, I bought some raw land there. And when I first got on my, on my property, and I, there was not even a road. It's two miles from Canada, right next to Glacier Park. Um, I saw a wolf on my property. The first time I walked on it was a gray wolf. And they had that greenish yellow eyes and he looked really mean uh, but he looked gaunt also he just looked but he looked terrifying to me but as I gradually would, worked on my road and built my little cabin my little hunter's cabin uh, he would show up every now and then and one time I got to ask uh, a, uh, uh, a a professor who was tracking these predators uh, about that wolf and he said well that's a lone wolf a lone wolf is an alpha male that got kicked out of the pack, and wolves hunt in packs. And that wolf, you know, is eating day-old meat. He's, he's, it's hard for him to get food. And uh, the only way he can become, the only way a wolf can really thrive is to be part of a pack. And I think that's true of us as men too. So many men want to be the lone wolf. I don't need other brothers. I don't need that. If you get with other guys, you talk about politics and you talk about sports, and then that, and that's about it. But you are here. And God has a special mission for you. If you're not part of a pack of brothers like Jesus had his 12, maybe you're just getting together for breakfast once every two weeks. Maybe you have a That Man Is You program here. Some of you might be on the, um, I forget the name of it now all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the Lenten, um, what is it called? Exodus 90, I got my text yesterday from them, or their phone call. You need to be part of a band of brothers, and you need to be raw. You know, like my friend, Father Bryce Lundgren, he's a cowboy priest in Wyoming. He said, if I'm riding my horse out with my buddy Zeke, and I said, hey, dude, we need to be vulnerable with each other, he would gallop to the nearest horizon. But he said, if I said, tell him we need to be raw and real with each other, we need to be gritty with each other, 
then, then he would respond to that. And we need that kind of brotherhood where we can say, dude, my teenage uh, son's doing this or I'm having problems with my wife or, or, or I myself am struggling with these issues. We need to have real brothers. So my challenge to you is if you're not in a small group of men, then God's asking you to start, to start that small group. Can we, um, I got to close. It went to zero, zero, zero. Zero hour. Bet you guys are glad. Can we stand one more time? Viva Cristo Rey! 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 Thank you, men. Aloha.